The ERMAC Centre is proud to present the SFU Canada Research Chairs Seminar Series. This bi-weekly series hosts six presentations per semester. For the fall 2008 and spring 2009 semesters, the presenters belong to the Faculty of Science and the current Faculty of Applied Science. Today's speaker is Dr. Derek Bingham. Dr. Bingham will present his talk entitled Efficient Emulators of Computer Simulators of Photometric Redshifts Using Compactly Supported Correlation Functions. Derek told me he didn't want an introduction because he, he knows you only want to listen to him, but I thought I'd read you the CV and prevent you from having to. Um, no, I'm going to just a quick, quick introduction. BSc from Concordia in 91, an MSc from Carleton in 94 while working at Anderson, and a PhD here at Simon Fraser uh, in 1999. Um, I can tell you about his coursework later. Um, NSERC scholarships, postdoctoral fellowship, Senate medal at, at Carleton, and, and of course a gold medal here at SFU. And then he went to Michigan um, for four years before we lured him back here as a CRC. Um, and uh, he has all sorts of awards, including an insert accelerator supplement, so he's cash rich. You should speak to him. Um, and, 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 and then that, that's all on the CV, but, but I, I want to say something about the stuff that is poorly captured on the CV. And when I wrote this down, I had in mind um, the, the contributions he makes to how the department feels, uh, to all the hard work that he does for students, and, and um, and his willingness to do just whatever needs doing. But uh, it turns out now that, that, that the stuff that's poorly captured on his CV extends to his publication list. Um, <coughs> we've just been through salary reviews, so I know. And, um, and of course, above all, he has a, a fabulous uh, sense of humor. Um, yes, OK, so all the rest of the insulting material I have to pass over, because I do want to retain Derek quite, quite badly. Um, and he's here today to talk about a title which is up on the screen. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, thanks for coming. I really appreciate uh, really appreciate your time. Um, so, what I'm going to do today is give a uh, give a general view of, uh, of kind of this, the sort of work that I do and sort of work my students are doing. And if anybody one day views this, um, you know, from outside this university, please hire all of my students. Um, they're, all, they're all really smart. They're much smarter than me. Um, this is the obligatory outline. Um, basically, I'm going to run through um, you know, the, notion, some, the notion of computer experiments. So this is the idea of, of doing experiments on computer codes or simulators of physical systems that are often too difficult to just keep running over and over. Even though you've built the simulator as a, as a cheap version or a, a, a way to explore reality, it, the, the, uh, the computer power or the computer uh, resources for, for running the simulator are often, uh, often very great themselves. So I'll give a bit, of a bit of a background on computer experiments, a few examples of things that we've worked on with my students and uh, colleagues. I'll give the example that motivated the current work to, and try to give you a flavor of, of the kind of stuff that, that, uh, that we're doing um, and some, uh, some new results. Now, I've got a lot of slides uh, in here, but I'm going to start, before I get to the good stuff, is I'm going to do a little bit of shameless promotion. Uh, so I am a faculty member in the Department of Statistics and Actuarial Science. We have about uh, 20 faculty members and about 40 graduate students, and, uh, and they're all really, really good. Um, I think that we're one of the top departments in the country. So that actually goes without saying. This is a very, very good faculty. And um, it's a very collaborative group. Um, you know, we, we range from being very theoretical to very applied, but most of us have collaborators. And I think that um, for those of you here in the university, reaching out to uh, members, of, uh, members of our department. That's a good thing. And I will say that my colleagues are really smart, and they're all much nicer than me. And so you could think of this, this talk as kind of, a, kind of a lower bound in all respects. Um, so, uh, so please, uh, you, know, if, um, you know, if you're looking for collaborators and you, you have interesting problems and interesting data uh, in particular, um, you, know, you should uh, knock on their door uh, first. And Anyhow, all right. So. I work in an area, uh, one of the areas I work in, rather, is something called computer experiments. And the idea is that there are simulators for, uh, people will build simulators for their different physical systems that they're interested in. So these range from crash tests at automobile manufacturing to climate models. And so we're all familiar with the global climate models these days. They seem to be in the news. Now, the simulators have inputs, right? So you have to, to describe the physical situation which, where you're going to run the simulator. 
And so while it's true that you're able to put some mathematics down often and physics down um, to describe the situation, the, the, the uh, describe reality, you may not actually understand the behavior at different sets of those inputs, those different, uh, under those different scenarios. So computer, just like in lab experiments, computer experimenters will change the inputs and observe how the, uh, the output changes. Now because these simulators can often take a very, very long time to run, or they're difficult to run and require specialized expertise to actually get going, um, often what happens is that people will be forced to, to come up with a cheap surrogate, a statistical surrogate for the computer model. So the computer model represents a view of reality and we have to approximate that as well. All right, and these computer models, the, the key thing here is that they are complex frequently, the ones we deal with, uh, simulators of reality, and they come from a variety of different, um, you know, they have a variety of different backgrounds when you open up the box, if you will, and look at the computer code. And frequently they are solutions to partial differential equations, they're, um, they are finite element analyses and those sorts of, uh, those sorts of things. And, and in many applications, you'll also find that they have a large number of inputs. Um, won't be the case in the application I'm talking about, but in some applications, you'll have 30 to 3,000 kind of sort of inputs um, that you, you want to experiment over. And the outputs themselves can be scalar quantities, um, but they can also be space-time fields or and basically any data structure that you would anticipate seeing in any other physical application. Um, one feature that's important to remember, and it's going to highlight, that I'd like to highlight now, but it's going to be a feature of this talk, is that the computer simulators that I'm dealing with are deterministic, in the sense that if you put the same inputs, you get the same outputs. Now, as a statistician, that's a very interesting sort of world, because we're usually dealing with noisy data, and in fact, we have noiseless data um, in this sense. We still have to approximate. Um, we want, we'd like to come up with a, an estimate of unsampled points, places where we haven't run the simulator. We'd like to estimate the, the, out, the response, and at the same time, come up with measures of uncertainty in, in a deterministic world, which is kind of interesting. Um, there's lots of research problems, and these are the issues that a lot of folks deal with. Anybody who deals with data, they're interested in a variety of different things, things like optimization, prediction, um, you want, sometimes you're interested in factor screening, um, integration problems, inverse problems, and there's a variety of them. So one such example is, a, is an example that we're currently working on, or I have a graduate student, Matt Bertola, who's doing some very interesting work, and he's looking at um, a simulator that models the transfer of energy uh, to the, mag uh, to the magnetic s magnetosphere from solar winds. So basically, this, he's looking at a space weather sort of problem. He's interested in the behavior in the upper atmosphere. And specifically, uh, let's see if I can get this here, the aurora borealis, that's what you have over here. And we have images taken from a satellite and so we actually have some satellite images of, the, of an aurora, and we have a simulator that actually models, um, that, that, that has built in physics to try to, to attempt to model the behavior of the, um, of the upper atmosphere during one of these events. And that's what you have down here, outputs from the model. Now the model takes in inputs, and this, this is actually a very specialized inverse problem. Now the, what we're interested in, the, the inputs are the parameters that govern the behavior of the aurora storm. And so what we want to know is what are those parameters? We can run the computer model. We could, to run the computer model, we have to stick in values of those parameters. That's what you have here. So these are the different places. These blue dots are the different values of three parameters where I've actually, we've actually run the computer model. What we want is the truth. What is the actual value in reality that governs the storm? So that's what we're after. And so after combining these sorts of things, we have this nice little plot here. These little, little, little blobs that you see are estimates of what the true value would be. And that's kind of a 95% confidence interval sort of idea that you have there. Now, it's not well constrained given the data we have, so that you have some areas of high probability here of, of, um, for, our, uh, uh, for, for our guess given our current computer runs or those computer runs and the actual data we have. But the basic idea that we, we would like to do is to start off by running some computer trials, looking at our, our physical data, combine, coming up with a statistical approach to combine these sources of information, and then go back and run, suggest new computer trials to run to come up with a better estimate here. The other thing that I've noted here on this, uh, this particular slide is that there are oftentimes there are different simulators. These can be from different groups. In our case, the, uh, the computer models take a long time to run, and we can run the models at high, higher, but different levels of fidelity. So the, cheap, the low fidelity models we can run really quickly, and the high fidelity models take a while. And so the idea is to you know, run a lot of low fidelity, model, uh, low fidelity trials and also get some high fidelity ones to come up with a better estimate. So that's, a, that's one example. Another example of something I've been recently, uh, recently been involved in is something called radiative shock. 
And uh, again, this has to do with, um, uh, oops, shocks that, um, so, so in this experiment here, uh, there's a particular experiment where a, a laser pulse um, basically shocks some beryllium, so there's a beryllium disc, and it shocks it down this tunnel, and the idea here is that we'd like to understand the, um, the behavior of the, uh, and make predictions for some of the, uh, the, the, uh, the propagation of this particular shock. And this has applications in, if you want to, if you want to study um, um, some different space weather issues. And, this, and the, the space weather issues then impact you know, satellite communications and the like. So this particular problem um, has a computer simulator. So those blue boxes are computer simulators. And in fact, they run in parallel. You, t you run a simulator, you get some output, you do something to it, run it to another simulator, and out, and out will come a variety of of measures that describe the actual shock. So that's what you see over here. And what we want to do is make good predictions of the actual physical value. Now, part of what we have to do is build a model to, to predict this. So we also have to choose where we're going to run these variety of simulators, the, the simulators. And those X's represent different physical settings, knobs, if you will, that we can dial. So the thickness of the beryllium disk and the actual laser pulse, we can actually, we, we can change, right? So we have, we're going to have physical data that's run. And we're we have this simulator system here. And we have to choose our experimental design so that we can build a model that will predict this guy a bit better. So that's one, one issue. The other issue is that there's some physical constants that have to be known in order to actually run this. And we would like to actually, they're known with some uncertainty, and we'd like to further constrain those. So that's a secondary goal is to further constrain these kind of unknown physical constants. All right, so what is the example that I'd like to go over today? And a particular problem that, that came to me from some collaborators at Los Alamos uh, in New Mexico, Los Alamos National Lab, it had to do with the, uh, something called the, uh, the Joint Efficient Dark Energy Investigation. So it's called JEDI, and JEDI is a, oops, JEDI is a satellite, and the idea is the satellite is attempting to study uh, dark energy. So what is dark energy? Well, not so long ago, theories about the, uh, about the the evolution of the universe went something like this. There was the Big Bang, everything explodes, everything kind of moves outwards. And the idea is that, you know, the, in the presence of dark matter, every, everything would start, you know, they would start moving out, and then everything would start pulling back together. And then you'd have the, the big crunch, right? That was the idea. And observations through a variety of telescopes, Hubble telescope, those sorts of things, indicated that, yes, well, the universe is going like this, but not only is it, not only is it expanding, it's accelerating. It's not slowing down and coming back. It's getting faster and faster, in fact, in, uh, in its acceleration. So what explains this growth spurt? So the, the standard model for physics had to be altered, and, uh, and that's where dark energy came in. And so the cause for this expansion of the universe is thought to be something called dark energy. I've highlighted up here that solving the mystery of, dark, uh, of the nature of dark energy is the most important problem in cosmology today. But I took that from somebody's grant proposal, so I don't know if it's really the most important. but. Uh, Anyhow, we're going to probe, uh, we're going to look at the at dark energy through spectroscopic redshifts. Okay, so, so we're going to look at the redshift of, of cosmological objects. That's really what's going on. All right, so just quick slide here. The universe is made up of stuff. Most of that stuff is this, this thing we call dark energy. But we can't observe it uh, directly, and we can only observe it indirectly through, measure, through measurements of things like uh, re the redshifts. Uh, come on now. So what is redshift? For those of you who don't remember your physics, as things are come down towards you, this is the Doppler effect for light. Um, an object comes towards you, it's shifted towards the blue lights. That's the sort of thing that we would see. As, and as an object starts moving away, it's all shifted off towards the red spectrum. And most things are moving away from us. And so what we're actually seeing is, the, uh, is, is far away objects shifted towards the red. Now, what's actually been observed, so there's us, this, things like the Hubble Space Telescope observe these things, these galaxies moving further and further apart, further away from us, and that the things that were further away were actually even more shifted towards the red. In other words, they're accelerating away from us, and that was the surprise. And that's what got people thinking about what the nature of dark energy actually is. So our setting goes something like this. Um, we have data, and from a computer simulator, we don't have, I'm not, don't have physical data at this point, and the scientists wanted to know whether we could build an emulator of, or a, phys a statistical model, if you will, but we're going to call that an emulator, of their current understanding of, of the uh, spectroscopic redshifts under different regimes, or under a particular regime of, uh, of uh, dark energy. Okay, 
so we want to build this. And I remember them, I, I talked to the people and uh, the folks who did this, and they said, well, we'd like to do this. And I said, well, you know, there's an existing methodology out there. Great, why don't you send me your data, I'll put something together for you, I'll send it right back. And I said, great. And they said, great, and that was it. And on a Friday afternoon, they sent this to me, and it turned out, I, you know, I was expecting, I don't know, five or 600 observations, and they sent me 20,000. And they said, well, we'll get the rest of you later, though. And I thought, oh, well, this is a bit of a problem, because the, tip the standard method that we have, or that we typically use for this, requires, somewhere along the way, and I'll get to this point, requires inversion of a, of a matrix of the size of the data. Okay? And they said, okay, but this is the first 20,000, we'll get the other 100,000 to you later, and you should be able to do this. And I thought, well, I can't actually do this on my laptop. And, and in fact, as, as when, this, when the satellite itself actually comes up, because um, this was before the satellite went up, the idea was is they would look at hundreds and thousands and millions of cosmological objects, not just 20,000. So we have to get methodology that's gonna work and work under a, a large data context. So the problem for us is that it's gonna be a lot of data. All right, so what is the crank that we turn in this field? So I said that there was a, there was a standard methodology for analyzing or using, looking at computer models. And the reason for doing it this particular way, um, we're gonna use something called a Gaussian process model. And the reason for doing this is that we have this deterministic simulator. So, so where does the randomness come in? So when you do regression modeling and standard statistical models, you usually have this mean function and you try to include enough stuff in the mean so that you have independent <coughs> errors. Well, that's not going to happen in a deterministic situation because what you sample is exactly the truth. And so the view is, we're, is that we're, instead of modeling this with a standard regression model, what we're going to do is view the, computer, the output of the computer model as a realization of a random function. So the randomness comes from the actual draw of the function itself. And so Gaussian process model is one way of doing, one way of doing that. So the randomness comes from the actual response, the whole response surface. Okay, you can think of that as being a random draw. So this has been successful in this field and in other fields, um, and, and that's what we're gonna use, but large n, so I'm gonna keep foreshadowing, large n is the problem. Okay, so what is, what is our data? We've got 20,000 points, more to come, and our problem is that sure is a large lot of data. So let me describe, um, I'm going the wrong way, aren't I? Oh, there we are. Let me describe the model a little bit and try to highlight where the problem is. So, so we start off with our data. So, the first thing that we get are the experimental, the experimental design. So that's the, the, the matrix X there. So each input to the computer model is a, is, is a, each input is a vector of P things. So think of it as setting temperature, pressure, that sort of thing. And you have to set that to run your computer model. And so each time you do that, you've got a, you've got a setting. And that's what, the, what each row of that matrix X represents. Okay, so I'm gonna have N rows, and N in this case could be 20,000, it could be more, and, uh, and P different variables. Now, we've got a model here where I say our response at that particular x, that's our, what we actually observe um, from the system, from, that's the output of the computer model. We're gonna model that as something that looks kind of like a regression model. So when you do, for those of you who've done kind of polynomial regression, what you typically have is some mean function here which would, which would represent a polynomial, this guy here, where it's gonna stick in a mean, it's not gonna matter. And typically what you'd see is some mean function and some, some IID, or independent and identically distributed error terms. And we're not going to do that at all. What we're going to have instead is just a constant mean. In fact, you could throw zero in there. It wouldn't really make a difference. And, um, but we're going to have these, these Zs here. These, each one's going to have an error term. And these error terms, well, they're all going to be correlated. And we're going to actually do all of our modeling through the correlation of these errors. Okay. So, the Zs themselves will be viewed as, as, a, as a draw from a multivariate normal distribution with a mean zero. And covariance is represented by this guy here. Okay, so the variance, that's the sigma squared uh, Z that you have here, but all the efforts gonna go into this guy are the correlation matrix between these observations. So, what do we got here? Okay, so the next guy is that, that correlation matrix. And so it's important to take a look at that. So let's, let's spend a few seconds, just let me point at that. The, what we wanna do is look at the correlation between observations at two different inputs, okay? What's important to note here is not the equation. What's important to note is there's a correlation parameter that says you know, things that are really correlated or really related to each other. Well, that correlation parameter, uh, in the way that I've done it, will actually be, will actually be um, if they're really related, they'll be high. And, and this point, this stuff up here, the stuff that's up in the exponential says the following. Things that are close by, where that difference is small, are gonna have co higher correlations than far away points. So what does this really mean? It's going to matter for prediction. When you make a prediction, 
nearby points are going to help you make a prediction of the unsampled value. This is going to have more effect and more help than far away points. So points that are more correlated, observations that are more correlated, are going to help you more than points that are not correlated. That's what you'd like. Okay, you'd like things that are nearby to, uh, to help you out. Okay, so we have a statistical model, and you can estimate this model any way you like. Right? You can be Bayesian about this, and so you can use Markov chain uh, Monte Carlo, or you can be frequentist, frequentist about this and do general uh, standard maximum likelihood sort of things. And when you want to make predictions, you can do this. So, there are, so people have worked this out. Uh, for those people who are familiar with Krieging, this would be uh, a Krieging model with a particular value of a particular correlation, specification of the correlation function. And that's, that was that um, product of the, those rows before. And there's this, you can also get a measure of uncertainty. So if you can do this, you don't have a problem. And the key feature to note, I'm going to say this, is in our predictions here. Our predictions, at the end of the day, there's a nice formula for it. This is the same stuff down here. And what I want you to know is that if I want to make a prediction, those predictions are just a weighted average of our data. Okay? But the weights themselves are based on the correlation, or the estimated correlation, of where you want to make a prediction and each of the data points. So you have this small r vector here. And it's going to represent a correlation between the point where x star, where you want to make a prediction, and in each one of that, the, the elements of that vector are going to be the correlation between it and each of the other data points, and each of the other places where we've sampled, we made, we've drawn samples, or we've sampled from the simulator. And the weights are going to be high for the nearby points and low for the faraway points. And that's what you'd like. I mean, if something was, you know, really far away, then you wouldn't want it to help you very much with prediction. Okay, so that's the spirit of what this is. Now, floating out there are these R's. Okay, so keep those guys in mind. So what actually happens? We sample from a function. So suppose you've got that, that black curve. So you take a sample from it. Now, we're going to sample directly on it because it's a deterministic simulator. Okay, there's no noise in our sample here. All right, so I've, only, I've got this sample of size 5, but I want to predict the whole curve. I don't have that. I don't have to specify the shape, though. Notice I didn't do that here. All I said was there's, there's a particular correlation function which tells me how smooth my data is going to be. So what ends up happening? The red line, the red curve that you have up here, well, that's our prediction. Okay? And there are a couple of things I'd like you to know. So the red curve goes right through the data, which is a very nice feature for, for fitting a model for a deterministic simulator. You know the actual value at the places you sample. So why not put the curve that you estimate to going through those points? Okay. The other thing is, is that when you're near your sample points, your uncertainty is much lower. And as you get further away from them, it grows. You've got these little football shapes in between the, uh, in between the data points. And as you, get, as you start moving closer to the next one, it starts shrinking. Okay? That's, that's actually what you'd like, because you know the curve at the sample points, at this sample point here, you know that, okay, near it, you kind of know its value too, because it can't shoot up and shoot down like that, or it's unlikely it would. Okay. All right, so let's go back here. I've got some same equations up there. The real key is this R is floating around this R inverse, and that R inverse is the size of your data, the amount of data that you sampled. And if you've got 20,000, 100,000, a million data points, then you've got to do this with each step of the evaluation of your likelihood um, or your statistical model, or if, uh, well, each time you evaluate your statistical model, and in, in order to estimate the parameters, you're going to have to do this. And also, in order to make predictions, and any time I want to make a prediction, I've got to have this guy inverted. Okay? So you need this guy floating around for estimating the model and also making predictions f through the system. And that's really where the problem lies for, for us. All right. So one of the uh, approaches that, that we considered was something called covariance tapering. OK, there's been some recent work in this. And this is used a lot in the geosciences. Um, and it kind of goes like this. So the first thing you want to do is observe that if you look at that giant matrix, the giant matrix R, a lot of those correlations are small. Because if you sample the space in general, the, the input space, you sampled it quite well, well, there are going to be some nearby points and some faraway points. And the faraway points, well, the correlations are going to be small. OK, well, that's good. So maybe you'd say, well, OK, just set it to 0. Right? And if you set it to 0, you get a lot of zeros in a matrix, and there's a lot of sparse matrix uh, um, programs out there that say, oh, great, there's a lot of, the, the matrix is essentially empty, it's full of zeros, then you can actually invert the matrix a lot quicker. Okay? So that's actually where we're going. But if you just start setting things to zero willy-nilly, what ends up happening is it's not actually a covariance matrix anymore. It's not represented by a statistical model. So you have to be very careful in the way that you do this. All right, so that's the big, the big point. Now, how does covariance tapering work? Well, it takes that original covariance that we had, okay, so sigma squared times r, and it multiplies it by another covariance. 
And that's called something called a compactly supported covariance. And the key feature of that is that it's still it's a covariance function for which you get a non-zero value up until a particular point. Once it reaches that threshold, it go, drops exactly down to zero. But it has all the special properties that a covariance matrix has. Okay, so positive semi-definiteness, all that sort of stuff, if, you're, if that's the kind of stuff that you like or you know about. So these resulting matrices can be, uh, can be manipulated using sparse matrix uh, operations, and that's where we're going to save our time. So we're going to stick, we're going to, well, you could, let's take a picture here, show you exactly what I mean. So this sort of banding that you have, this sort of pattern, won't actually happen in our case, but this is, this is more there for illustrative purposes. So here's your original covariance, okay? So the highly correlated points are in red, and the low, the low correlations are out here in blue. So if you actually had this ability to sort like this, then you could pull this off. So what you'd see here is that the second, if you go to the second row, it's very close to the first row in distance, and so they'll be highly correlated, okay? Now, that won't necessarily be the case. In, in, it won't be the case in our setting. Now, a compactly supported covariance is what you see the second guy. Now, in this, in this particular case, what you'll see is that, well, there's correlations along here, but you get to a certain point, and it drops down to exactly zero, and that's the black stuff that you see. Okay. Now, if you take a sure product here, when I say multiply, it's a very particular product, is that you multiply this element by element-wise. So over here, the product is the first element of the first matrix times the second element, the first element of the second matrix. Okay. And the resulting version, tapered version of our covariance matrix, is this other guy. So all those, the, the, black, the, black, sh the black region in the, in the second matrix just wipes it out in the first one. Okay, and you end up with this nice, nice banded covariance matrix. Like I said, the banding won't happen in my case, but you'll have these black spots everywhere. And you can take advantage of that. Okay, all right. So while we were doing this, so, you know, what do you do? You put this together, you start proving some theory, you give it a shot, you try it out, so you can, you, can you actually invert the matrix, that sort of stuff. And we're going along, we're doing this stuff. And uh, in one of the simulations, we said, well, let's, uh, let's just throw away our original covariance model and just use the, the, you just pretend, let's just do an estimate just using that guy. Turned out it didn't work so bad. Turned out it worked very well. And, uh, and almost, and so I thought, well, you know, maybe we could throw away this entire matrix and fitting the parameters for that matrix and just ignore it and just use the, the compactly supported covariance as our covariance model. And that's what we're going to do. Okay, so what's our proposed approach? Our proposed approach looks kind of like this. <clears throat> we're going to propose a, a, a different model. The reason we're doing this is for computational reasons. This is not a competitor of the original one. This is, the, this is what we would use when we can't fit the original model. We have too much data to, to do with it. We're going to introduce a mean model, and basically what that's going to do is, is, is to take account or try to attempt to account for large range variability or large scale variability, and we're going to use a compactly supported covariance model which produces a sparse matrix which we can actually manipulate, and this will take care of small scale variability. That's the idea. So we're going to fit something like a universal creaking model, for those of you who know about this, with a compactly supported covariance. That's the idea. Um, the degree of sparsity uh, is going to be controlled by the range parameters. How far out do you have to go, right? So if I, before you set something to zero. So there's going to be a parameter for each dimension that says, well, you know, when do we start in this compactly supported covariance, how far away do we have to go before we set that guy exactly equal to zero? Okay, that's going to be one of the key things. And we're going to, do our, we're going to be Bayesian about this, which means we're going to, uh, and we're going to use uh, MCMC for, uh, for estimation method, but for those of you who aren't familiar with it, basically this, you can view this as a computational method. All right, so what's our proposed approach? So you've seen this slide before. It goes something like this. I've got my data. I've got my x's, for instance. My, uh, my responses, just like before, I observed my, my responses at particular values of x, and those are my y's, except now I've got, this, uh, I've got a mean model here. And the reason is, if you think about it, if suddenly I'm going to not take into account, I'm only going to take account of the covariances or the correlations that are within a particular range, a very small range, what happens if things are actually related far away? Something like a straight line, right? If you know this point and this point, then this faraway point is actually going to help you in your predictions. So what are you going to do, right? So what we're going to do is use the mean model to describe that kind of long range uh, variation or long range uh, dependence. But we're still going to have a random function, which is our z. And it looks just like it is before, but the specification of it's going to be different. And it's going to be based on a product of correlation functions. But these correlation functions will be based on how far they are apart, just like before. 
but it's going to use the, one of these compactly supported covariances so that when you go beyond, and that distance between in a particular dimension is beyond tau for that particular dimension, or beyond a range parameter, it gets identically set to zero. Okay? All right, so we didn't invent these. There exist. There's a whole industry for creating um, covariance functions out there for different, different reasons. Um, the idea, again, over and over, uh, hammering at home, is that we're doing this um, in, to, for computational reasons. Um, and for, if you think about it, um, these are compactly supported covariances are particularly useful um, because you, you, know, you really want those, those nearby points to have correlations. What, the, what it's really doing is saying, well, for those far away points, we're just going to set them to zero. Okay? So in some ways, it has some of the features that you'd like. In other ways, it's not, not quite perfect. And I'll show you why through some simulations. What am I doing for time? Does anybody get an idea? Since there's oh, there's a clock there. All right, 20 minutes. OK. So, um, oops. OK, so what's a compactly supported covariance? I've said it in words, but just to, uh, I have this up on the, the screen to describe it. So for each dimension or each input variable, there's going to be a correlation function. And the correlation function has the property that, uh, you know, it follows some specification. And except for when you get beyond the range parameter for that particular dimension, it gets set to zero. Now, if those range parameters are each left at the original length of the, um, the, the, the range that we explored for each parameter, so for each input, if I just say, well, we looked at temperature from this, this value to this value, and if I let tau be that, that length, well, guess what? I get the original model out. But what we want to do is shrink that, is, is to shrink that tau down so, so that we can get um, local information. But that'll also allow us to get sparsity through the matrix. Um, now, though, the taus themselves for each dimension are going to play two different roles. If the taus are left big, then my, matrix won't, my correlation matrix won't be small. If they're less small, then it'll be very sparse. And I typically want something sort of in between. It also controls the degree of correlation in each dimension. For something that's really wiggly, going up and down like that, well, the correlation between a faraway point and, a near, and the two points that are far away is going to be very small. If something's going like this, this point here is not going to help you predict that point very well. Whereas if you have something that's really smoothly varying, faraway points will actually help you. So in some dimensions, some inputs will impact the system in a very wiggly way, and some may be very smooth. And so that degree of correlation we want, we want to be able to capture. We want to be able to capture the signal for each dimension in different ways they have a different impact on the, on the physical system. And so we're going to actually have to estimate those parameters. Um, we don't want them to be too big. Um, in fact, they have to be small enough so that we can at least invert the matrix, at least once, right? We can't let them, we can't just can't let them, to, uh, we can't let them just go off and be too large, because otherwise we just can't handle it for even just one iteration of, a, of the MCMC or one evaluation of the likelihood. Now up on the, uh, up on the screen there are some equations that you should just gloss over. These are just two of many uh, versions of uh, compactly supported covariances, but this is what a function might look like. Um, so for instance, the second one is the Bowman, which says for when the distance between two values, or two, two x's, if you will, the, the i-th and the j-th data points in the, in the k-th dimension, if they're some distance apart, then the correlation function will be described as what you, what you see there, sums of sines and cosines. If, it get beyond, if you go beyond the range tau, it goes exactly to zero. It's set exactly to, identically to zero. That's all I really want you to know. And there are a variety of them. Uh, this, for the, the type of model that we're using, the second one, the Bowman function, um, represents or models, it has a similar behavior to the statistical model that's typically used for uh, using computer experiments. So we typically, we, we'll use this guy. All right, the other thing to note, um, so for prediction, um, uh, the nearby points, again, will have the most impact. Now, if you only use the correlation function, what's going to happen? So for something that's smoothly varying, you're only going to use the points, when you make a prediction, you're only going to use the points that are in the, in the local neighborhood of the point of where you want to make your prediction. There may not be a lot of points there. And if the correlations are really long range, you kind of miss their, their, their impact or the benefits of having those other points. But we certainly can't include them because we wouldn't be able to invert the covariance matrix. We got a problem. And so what we did instead was, that's, why we, that's the reason we put the mean function in, that f, f beta there. And in fact, we ended up using, so you could use typical, just the polynomials in the original scales. We use Legendre polynomials. And part of that is just for setting up priors for, uh, prior distributions for, for our, um, 
our, uh, uh, our model. Um, the, the other feature is that they're orthogonal polynomials and they're convenient, convenient to use. All right, um, so I do have some time. Um, so there's stuff we can prove, um, and some of it I can prove. Um, and it goes something like this. So there's one, there's a series of theorems that we can, we can put together, but there's one that's kind of useful. It says the following. As I collect more data, um, the mean squared error, or think of that as your squared prediction error, for the true model, that's what you see on the bottom, okay, the mean squared error for the y hats under the original model that we were trying to estimate, and the mean squared error of our tapered version, it's not really a taper here, but of our compactly supported covariance, well, the ratio of their mean squared errors go to one. In other words, well, under, so as this is an asymptotic result, so way off in infinity, I'm doing just as good with my model as I am, as I, as I would do if I had the, the original model. Okay, well, you think, well, okay, well, who collects infinite amount of data? Well, actually, I'm kind of in a large data setting anyway. I've got a ton of data, and in fact, I do pretty well compared to the, compared to the, the truth, at least on the ones that I can evaluate. And the theory says, well, in some limit, which I can't actually evaluate my model or the original model, we should do just as well. So the theory points to this being a good idea. Now, this is under a non-Bayesian setting, so I'm kind of borrowing theory from one setting and saying, well, you know, it points to the right idea, but I'm going to be Bayesian for the way I estimate these things, but it is what it is. All right. Uh, I'm going the wrong way. All right, so some prior distributions, so I have to set up this problem, and I'm not going to go over the prior distributions. What you really want to know is one guy I would like to talk about um, here in this particular problem. Excuse me, I've got to get some water here. The range parameters. The only parameters I have to set for the co or estimate for the covariance, param covariance model is, are, are the range parameters. And they govern two different issues, right? They govern the sparsity, degree of sparsity in the covariance matrix, and also the degree of correlation. Estimated for e the correlation parameters for each, the they govern the correlation in each dimension. Now, if I could let all those tau's be large, if I let them just go to the end of the possible range, that I have the original model. So you'd think, well, I'd like to explain, explore that well. But at the same time, you can't evaluate the model if you let them get too big. So you have to be able to make sure that at each iteration of your, let's say, the optimization algorithm or the MCMC, I'm able to actually handle the matrix that, I, that I'm dealing with. OK, so what are we going to do? So what we did was the following. We said, well, let's suppose all the tau's were equal. This is because I don't know. I don't know who's, 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 which dimension is it's going to have a lot of signal, which one won't, which one has smoothly varying outputs and which ones don't. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend they're all equal, and I'm going to try a value where they sum up to everything. Okay, I'm going to take the sum to be some, some constant. We'll call it C. And I'm going to, so with that, I can throw that, I can evaluate my, my covariance matrix, and I can just see if I can invert it. Okay, there's nothing to fit. I'm just going to, I'm going to pretend all the tau's are equal, because as soon as I set C, all I have to do is Estimate tau is p times, p times tau will equal to c. p is the dimension of the uh, number of inputs I have. And I can actually just estimate tau based on whatever I've chosen. So just choose a constant. Then look and see what happens. Can you evaluate the matrix? No. Nope. Well, choose a smaller value at c. And just keep trying. So that's, that's actually what we did. So you got a bit of trial and error to get this thing going. And then we said, well, OK, but then we know they're not all equal. So what are we going to do? So what we decided to do, so in a two-dimensional case at least, here's a, an example up here. What we did was we said, okay, well, let's just, let's just assume that the sum of the, well, we'll start off by assuming that the tau's are equal, and under a particular value of c, that gives you, that tells you what the maximum value for x1 or tau1 and tau2 can be. And what we're going to assume is that the, we're, we're going we're to build, we're going to Put in the constraint that the sum of the tau's, even if, even if I let the tau's change, the sum of the tau's have to equal c. Okay, or, sorry, have to be less than or equal to c. Pardon me, they don't have to equal c. They can be less than or equal to. All right, and so then what we said was, well, we'll let the tau's, we're only going to choose tau's that lie on this, this region that are below it, that are bounded by the, the coordinate axes, and, and that, that constraint that the sum of the tau's have to be less than c, less than or equal to c. So, our, so when, we, when we get our solution, the tau's are going to lie somewhere in here. Okay, so that's the basic, basic idea, and that's important. So um, for setting this whole thing up, this, we, we took a uniform, you know, for those of you who are following the details, we took a uniform prior on this triangle in higher dimensions, it's a hyper triangle that, um, that, uh, that we're faced with. 
All right, so let's take a look at a, a quick example. So here's a, a physics model that is based on, it's, uh, based on, um, uh, that describes the, the flow of water through a particular aquifer. Okay, so, and there are eight inputs to this model, and uh, there's a response, there's a scalar response here. All right, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna choose values of C to try this out. I'm gonna try to explore some of the values of C, this constant, so the sum of the tau's give us, I said, I probably should have done one, uh, 100 minus these numbers. So with a level of sparsity, is 2%, that means I have 98% zeros in, in my covariance matrix or my correlation matrix and 2% values non-zero. Similarly, I chose another value of C where I got 5% non-zero and 95% zero and 10% non-zero as well. So we're gonna, just, we're gonna choose different values of C and I'm gonna do some simulations. Now, first thing I can say is, okay, well, I'm, what I'd like to do is four places where I can actually fit my model and fit the standard model, the usual model, I'm going to um, I'm going to compare. I'm going to, I'm going to generate data from that model and I'm going to see how well we do and see how well the standard models does. And I'm going to compare the, uh, compare the results. All right, so what did I do? I generated 2,500 observations from the, um, I just randomly sampled in the eight dimensional space, uh, 2,500 observations and I put five aside. Put them over in a, in a bucket, if you will. And I fit my model using the remaining 2,000 observations. All right, so there's some choices I have to make in fitting my model too, which is one of them is the degree of the polynomial. Okay, so that's what we're gonna have down here um, on, the, on the x-axis, so that the, you know, what degree of Legendre polynomial, and by, by degree, what I mean is we looked at main effects, two-factor interactions, and when I have a degree two, that means I can look at quadratic and also linear interactions, okay? Um, those sorts of things. So when I had degree three, I can look at uh, you know, linear, quadratic, and cubic terms, but my interactions will include um, product between uh, cubic and, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, powers of two and powers of one, for instance. All right, and what do we have on the y-axis? Well, what I did was I fit our model, and I fit, we fit the, the standard model, and then we predicted the 500 points that we left aside. And then we took the squared error, the average squared error, which is our, the MSE, and then we took the ratio of the squared error prediction errors, the squared prediction errors for the, the, the standard model and our model. So let's take a look here. So down here, um, I fit the zeroth degree polynomial. In other words, I just fit a mean function. I didn't fit, put the Legendre, Legendre polynomials using my approach, and I fit the standard model, which has a mean function. And, uh, and, and I predicted the 500 points. All right, so the first one, this one up here is where I have 98% zeros, that's a solid line, and down here is where I have 90% zeros. Okay, so that's gonna be, the less sparsity I have, the better I, I end up doing. Okay, so let's take a look. So for the case where I have the zeroth order polynomial, I do, in terms of MS, the ratio of MSEs, I do 200 times worse than the, the standard model, okay? But as the degree of the polynomial goes up, it appears that I'm doing actually much better, I, or at least it looks like I'm going down, I mean, it's hard to say because the scale here is so high, that it looks like I'm going down towards something like zero or one. So if we focus in on this little box here, so if you look at the slide there, we've got a little gray box that circles three and four, and that's what the right-hand plot is. It's the same, same thing that we're measuring, but we're measuring, this is the third degree polynomial and the fourth degree Legendre polynomial included. What we see is that we're doing about as well, uh, the ratio is about one, and in this particular case, for this particular case, uh, we do much, much better with a fourth degree polynomial. That is not a general phenomenon, okay? It's just that this is smoothly varying enough that the long range dependence actually has, has some impact. The Legendre polynomials don't do a bad job of capturing some of that, okay? So this is not a feature. What, you, what we're really hoping for is getting one. We just got lucky with this example, so I don't wanna overstate, overstate the results here. Um, how are we doing? What's on the next slide? I think I'm gonna skip that example. Um, somebody can ask me if you have some other questions about some of the, um, some of the results. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's go back to JEDI here. Let's go back to the original, the original problem. So I took 20,000 points. I figured we'd start with that. And then they sent us the, uh, the, the, some of the remaining points out of their suite of runs. And I do have the time to tell you that actually, so where did the suite, you know, I start off by saying some of these computer models 
are really slow. Like some of the, the global climate models take six months to run to get one data point, right, on a supercomputer. And they can do, they can, they can do something like eight runs a year, right? And that's all, that's all they have the resources for. In our case, I've got like 100, I've got more than 100,000 points. The thing is, is that this particular computer model, uh, there was one person who knew how to run it. He was at the University of Chicago and he was tired of people calling him up and saying, I need, I need some stuff. And he said, well, he just ran this thing. It was pretty fast, but it required that he get the whole thing going. It was probably, it was probably part of his PhD dissertation and you know, resides on one supercomputer there. So, so basically he made these suite of trials and, will, and was continually to push, continuing to push some out. Um, but you, you, you know, so this is a case where the computer model's fast, but it required some specialized expertise to actually do it. All right, so we have a validation set. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna fit my model using 20,000 points and I'm going, to, um, I'm going to estimate the other 100,000. All right, so this is what you see. So for those of you who, like, uh, who know some stuff about Bayesian statistics, those are your trace plots. Um, I'm gonna ignore those. And the, um, but what you see down here is the, um, the prediction versus the, the truth, if you will. So I have, so for my validation set, I've got some X's, which are represented by different light filters, and I've got, uh, I've got the Y's, the, observ the observations from the computer model. So I can actually make the predictions of those 100,000 points and see how well I did. And if I was perfect, then everything would lie on this straight line. So given this talk, we're almost an hour in, and you look at that plot and you think, man, that sucks. Um, which is my first thing, my first thought was, why doesn't this work? Okay, so then, then I, I called them up and I said, well, I, I, got, a, I, got, a, I got a bit of a problem. Um, this, to, you know, what, what's going on here? And so we, after some explanation, they said, well, okay, so first off, between point, beyond, below 0.5 and above 1.5, they said, well, that's not, it doesn't actually exist. We just kind of threw it in there to see what would happen. I was like, oh, okay, that's good. And then they said, well, I said, well, what about these things over here? I said, like, why, why are they so far from their neighbors? Because if you looked at the actual, if you found the nearest neighbors to some of those points, you'd say, wow, you know, they're, you know, they're really close. Like, why aren't they doing well? And they said, well, well, of course, there's degeneracies in the computer code. And I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what that means. They said, well, you know, because what will end up happening is that sometimes it'll go along like this, and it'll, it'll spike up like this just for one point and then kind of continue along. And I said, well, that, that, that's bad. Um, so, so, uh, so that, but, but there's no, no real way to identify this without, without actually doing something uh, that we, we hope to do in the future, which is kind of a robustness, kind of a robust version of this, which would try to kind of identify points as potential, potentially strange given the covariance model. But if you look between 0.5, even if that's the case, between 0.5 and 1.5, and what you see here are uh, uh, 90 and 95% uh, credible intervals, um, you'll see that we're, you're actually doing a pretty good job if you kind of use your imagination and focus in on those parts. So anyhow, I'm willing to go with that. I think I'm going to stop here and say that, um, you know, we, the kind of stuff that I do, um, I think covers a broad variety of science. And if there's folks in the, um, in the audience who would like to talk to me or more importantly, talk to my students because they're, they're much smarter than I am, um, then that would be great. Um, and uh, and uh, for this particular, this is just one part of what we're doing. It's, it was a simple innovation that took a little bit of, little bit of work, but it, uh, it seems, to, seems to be able to handle problems that are, that are much larger. One of the things I haven't gone into is how much larger, and usually we can look at kind of an order, uh, somewhere between one and two orders of magnitude, depending on the, the actual smoothness of the function. So, all right, I'm gonna stop there. Thanks. So are there any questions? Uh, please, when you do have a question, please use the microphone so we can record and stream it out. Yeah. So suppose, I mean, suppose you're talking about a weather model, for example, and the, ac the accurate one or complex one takes six months to run, and it's deterministic, but imagine that the actual weather has real uncertainty in it, maybe from the particles that the molecules are made of or something. I mean, you're not going to get around it by measuring more things. So then you fit your simpler model in which you put in the stochastic, the uncertainty part. Is that saying anything about the uncertainty in the weather or only about how um, the uncertainty in your simpler model approximating the more complex model? Right, so infinitely many values runs of a, of a lower fidelity simulation. So, the, so, so it'll help you learn about, um, if it's the same model and run at lower fidelity, it'll help you, perhaps help you learn about the, I'll say perhaps, because it won't always be the case, about the computer model. It will not help you learn about the weather, 
right? It's, it only speaks to one thing, right? And in fact, there are, there are versions of models where people have explicitly made, so, so you, can, you can view in some places where people have put data together, people have sat back and said, hey, look, if you collect infinitely many data points, it cl your model is claiming I know a lot more about the weather if I collect more and more from the simulator. And that's just not true. And there are people who've made, who've, who've brought up other models. Um, I think they're called reified models, where the computer models will pass through a particular model in a, in a limit, but that's still a step away from the truth. So since the large data set gives you some problem like to find the inverse of the big matrix, have you think about it to look at uh, like a kind of local version, like uh, you know, look at when you do the prediction or you when you com come up with the model, you will do like kind of local version, like just to look at some neighbor, neighbor of the data set. So the, answer, yeah. so the answer is yes. So, I, so, so we actually, so I give you one flavor, one solution. So the other, the other approach, the first approach that we looked at was a local pseudo likelihood approach. So what you can do, is imagine doing the following. For each point in space, you form a neighborhood, maybe collect it, maybe do it by numbers, like 25 nearest neighbors, or you can do it by based on distance by putting a sphere or a hypersphere around each point. And you fit a likelihood, or not even fit a likelihood, you can write down the likelihood, right? And you take the product of those likelihoods, because each one of these, uh, we're assuming that these, the, the behavior is governed by the same parameters everywhere. And you take the product of those likelihoods, but each one of those products may only be, a tw you know, contain a 25 by 25 matrix. Right? And then you can do that. You can, you, can build, you can estimate your parameters that way. And when you make predictions, you can build a similar neighborhood, and off you go. That works pretty well. Um, it doesn't give you a, co a coherent covariance model, because I can be your nearest neighbor, but you don't have to be one of mine. And so you don't have the sym natural symmetry. So it's not really represented by a coherent model, but it actually does pretty well. So one day we might write that up. One, one way to deal with large matrices is mm, what you're doing is to make them sparse. Uh, another way would be to make them circular. Um, and then you could work with Fourier transforms. Um, has that been tried? Does that make any sense in the background of this? Or, um, or? So the answer is, I haven't, so it's one, of, it's one of the things that's been suggested that we haven't looked into. Okay, so the answer is, does it make sense? The key thing is, is that you don't have any structure in the covariance. Right. Other than, you know, we don't, so I showed you something that was banded, but we actually don't have that, right? Because we're operating in more, more dimensions than, than one. Um, where you're working in one dimension, you can, you get the banding. And if you get work in more than one, then you'll get like a checkerboard pattern, right? To, uh, to the covariance. In higher dimensions, you would get block, block circular matrices. You might. If, if there's a natural sorting, you wouldn't necessarily get, get any sorts of things. So think of it as eight, eight dimensions. If you take a look at that, the actual covariance matrix, you won't, you won't necessarily get that you won't get necessarily get blocks because there's no natural way to collect, the, to collect the blocks of data. So that's, that's where the problem is. You don't get the, the natural structure. So the best you can do is just hopefully, you know, your checkerboard, you know, overwhelms the, the covariance matrix. But there are other things that can be done, certainly. Um, but unfortunately, the lack of, lack of structure won't allow you to do things like, you know, work with the inverse only instead, you know, so which is, which is what which is, will happen in some of the, um, uh, you know, large data problems that people do with, um, empirical covariance matrices and things like that to work on the inverse. We don't have that kind of, we have no structure other than the hope that there's a lot of zeros. So. Okay. <clears throat> so do I understand this correctly that your, your, your whys are deterministic, so they're not what we would no think of as a typical random response, but you're, but you're using statistical tools? in order to estimate yeah, so this response surface? That's exactly it. Okay, so that, does that mean that the, the choice of model used multivariate normal, was that just for convenience? Does that matter at all? Um, does the choice of model matter? Um, it's probably for more for, for convenience than anything else. The, so so you, you need a random model. So, what, so if you think of yourself, think of, think of a, a Bayesian model for the sake of it, where you've got a, 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 a polynomial model, but you, you start off by viewing the the coefficients as random, as, as random variables. Now your data happens to be one realization where the, 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 the coefficients are fixed, but they came from some giant distribution. That's a random function. Our random function, we're, we're just specifying it as, as a Gaussian one, um, and you can think of it as a prior distribution on the set of possible entire response surfaces. So when we, when we view our data, we view our data as, as points on a particular random function that has been drawn. Okay, so could you put something else there? Yeah, you could put something else there. But it represents, I mean, that thing is, is hugely flexible um, if you have some, particularly if you have some stationary constraints. Like you're assuming that the behavior of the function is similar over here, the value may not be the same, 
but the wiggliness, if you will, will be the same over here and over here. Then you can, uh, then they're really, um, really quite convenient. I don't think that, I don't know what, what, the, what the gains would be to switching it over to something else as a prior, if you will, on the class of functions. And just just comment to your question. I worked on those cringing before. Some in, in our area, I mean engineering, they even use just a simple constant. It still works similarly fine. It's standard polynomial, other functions. It's just back to my the question I have is, I mean engineering, but the problem I have is like engineering design. Think about the car simulation, the crash simulation. It takes 100 hours right now. It's pretty much for one simulation. So the problem we're getting is, for us, is twofold. First one is we have a large number of input variables. We're talking about hundreds of design variables. Yet, but we don't have a lot of data. We want a sparse data, just only a few points, as few as possible, because we want to speed up the design process. So we get into crane game, but the problem we found is when I get into crane game, it's hard to model the large, uh, say, large dimensional problems. So part of the reason is the matrix. And also another difficulty is we don't have enough points. So I'm not sure if you have any work done in this area. Okay, so you need nearby points. Okay, so here's just an example here. We have two active dimensions. And, and if I project 1,000 points on those two active dimensions, and I want to make a prediction where that little x is, if you can, if you can see that, it's at the center of that kind of colored set of points, then you can, we can see the 10, the 50, and the 100 nearest neighbors in these different colors. Okay? And so when you're making a prediction there, you've got all these nearby guys. Now, if I have 10 active dimensions and project it to the same two dimensions, Okay, then the 20, 50, and 100 nearest neighbors are shown here. So if you notice, in, in those two, so they're nearest neighbors in the sense of the 10 dimensional space, but when you project onto two, take a look at what happens. So what ends up happening is some, in some dimensions, some of these points are always going to be far away. And what you end up predicting, your predictions will actually be just whatever your mean function is. That's what your prediction will be. If I want to make a prediction here, there's a couple of nearby points, they may help those one or two, and, and then everything else, the correlations are they're so far away, the correlations are essentially zero. So, what, so if you do mu plus z of x, you're basically predicting mu with a little bit of wiggle, right? And that's it. And it's going to do crappy to do these sorts of things. So what you're left with is the following. You can either put a high-degree polynomial on this thing and suck up the overfitting and just say, listen, I may overfit here. I'm going to put a lot of terms in this. Um, and what I'm really doing, if you, if you keep including polynomial terms, Right? You'll say, because you're going to have a lot of data, or relative, so you'll be able to fit a lot of terms relative to the number of polynomial terms. You can do that. And what the, the z of x will do will force the, the response surface to go down through your data. So it'll, it'll at least get those, the nearby points to where your data are, right? And, the, and hopefully there's a polynomial representation. I think that's the best you can do when you start running 200 points in 20 dimensions. Right? If you, I mean, I, they're, they're just, it's almost hopeless. To, uh, so I, so I, mean, I think beyond just modeling the mean, I don't think a covariance approach is what you want to do. Yeah, I just wanted to make a final comment that I'd meant to make at the beginning, which was to thank Derek uh, for all the contributions he's made to the smooth running of Ermax and hopefully to the future successes. He's been a major asset to us, so thank you, Derek. All right. Thanks for your time. Thank you. The focus of the SFU Canada Research Chairs Seminar Series is to provide an opportunity to the wider SFU community to learn more about the current research interests of the SFU Canada Research Chair holders. Our next presentation will be on February 26, 2009. Dr. Boyan Mohar will present his talk entitled, How to Draw with a Small Number of Crossings.